Okay, everybody, let's pray and dive into uh, Proverbs again. And I hope you never get tired of Proverbs because uh, it, it is a source of so much practical uh, wisdom. But let's pray. Lord, bless our time in your word. Uh, open our eyes to behold wonderful truths from your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Proverbs is all about living life God's way. God's saying, if you, do, if you live life this way, you'll have my blessing, and if you don't, then I resist your life. And so man's way is a way of foolishness. He goes with the crowd. His mind is empty of God's truth. He is spiritually non-responsive. That means dead. He is hardened or callous. I'll tell you a callous story. Uh, I went to visit one of my friends in college, and he raised cows, his family did. And his mother was a typical Texan. Um, she, she was just a wonderful hostess. And we got in the Jeep and went out to see their cows. And their cows were called Barzonas. And they stood about this tall. They were black and gigantic. They're, they're a very large uh, beef cow. And the mother said, said, have you ever learned about branding? And I, branding is where you take a, a metal shape put it into a fire till it gets red hot, and then they push it against the side of the cow, and it makes a mark on the cow. Sounds horrible to me, but that's how they identify the cows in Texas. So she walked up to one of these black cows that I could not see over the cow. It was so tall and big. And she was wearing a hat, a big hat. And when you wear a big hat in a windy area, you pin it. So hat pins, if you've ever heard of them, are about this long. They're a pin that's, you know, pointed in metal that's holding her hat on. And she pulled out a hat pin. She walked up to that cow and she said, I, I'm going to show you something you'll never forget. I thought, wow. And she took her hat pin and went to the brand mark on the side of the cow. And she went and stuck the hat pin into the brand that cow never stopped chewing. It didn't even move. She said, don't worry, it can't feel anything there. It's calloused. It's lost all sensitivity in the brand. She looked at me and she said, sin calluses. Sin makes you lose your feeling." She said, you're going to be in the ministry. Don't ever forget that. And I thought, can you tell? I've never forgotten that. You know what God says? Unsaved people are so used to sin, they don't feel anything. They don't feel God's conviction. They don't feel bad. They just, they just keep sinning. And the longer you sin, the more it deadens you, it empties you, and you begin looking at worshiping yourself. And pretty soon you mock at sin. You laugh. Uh, when I was um, a student at Michigan State University, the professor started my class. His first words were, I am going to spend this class showing you that Christianity is mythology. He mocked at mocked God, mocked the Bible, mocked sin. And God says, those that are going man's way are perishing. And by the way, their, their path gets darker every day. So where are we in our journey? We are on stop number eight. We're looking at, uh, first we looked at salvation, servant-heartedness, being selective in our, our lifestyle, being submissive to God, singularly focused, self-controlled, which is a fruit of the Spirit stewardship minded with our money and now we're looking at being studious and i call this embracing a godly work ethic and look at my picture how do you like this god says work hard and don't be lazy he actually says that work hard and don't be lazy that's not what your parents say that's not what your boss says god says that if you want Wisdom, 
Wisdom is only found God's way. And God's way is not like this world's way. I remember when I used to uh, work in different places, you always have somebody at work that works real hard when someone's watching. As soon as they don't watch, you know, it's like when the boss comes, they're sweeping and just working. And as soon as the boss goes, they stop and they lean and they get on their phone and they're just doing nothing until they hear the boss is coming back and they sweep. And they think that that's okay. God says, no, laziness is man's way. God's way is a hard work, diligence, and a work ethic. And so we're going to trace that through the scriptures. So let's start uh, by going to 2 Thessalonians 3. So real quickly, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And look how hard it was for Paul. When Paul went to minister, he was ministering to people that were pagans, that weren't exposed to Proverbs, that weren't exposed to God's wisdom. They were just normal people. And look what he says to him in verse 10. For even when we were with you, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, we commanded you, if anyone will not work, neither shall they eat. Boy, that's harsh. Did you know that's part of American culture right now? That, did you know that's a cultural problem in America? Our American government is devoting more and more and more resources to give people, you know what they call it? Um, guaranteed minimum income or something like that. Right now, there are cities in America that give all the people $500 a month. They just give them $500 a month. They don't have to work. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to go to school. If you live in that city, they deposit $500 a month in your account. I'm not going to tell you where. I don't want you to move there. You know, but it's growing. And what it is, is it's an idea of a society that denies God's work ethic. That's, that's, that's what the Roman Empire did. And that's part of why the Roman Empire failed because they started feeding the people without them having to work, and they spent their whole day at the games, going to the Colosseum, watching sports and stuff. Okay, verse 11. For we hear that there are some among who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through the Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness, and eat their own bread. God's work ethic is that we work. And and Paul didn't just suggest it. He said, I command it. So this is the conclusion. God is opposed to laziness. Now let's start reading around again. We got all the way around, so we're going to start in just a minute with Rose. And Rose is going to read six, you know, and right down the line, uh, um, Wait a minute, Kelly, seven, Sophie, eight, Guppy, nine, um, and I'll read 10 and 11, because I, I, I love those verses. So here we go. Rose, Proverbs 6, verse 6. After the end, O beloved, consider her ways and her laws. For you don't have a good thing she offers your own rule. She prepares her bread and swimmer and gathers her food and harvest. Oh, when you lie down and slow drink, and when you rise from your sleep. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Now I wrote in my Bible, uh, if you guys write in your Bibles, let me get to Proverbs 6. It says, verse 11, so shall your poverty come on you like a prowler. What does that mean? What do prowlers do? They come when you're not watching. It's unexpected. That's what that means. You know, the Proverbs are to give you a, they're picturesque. And so your poverty comes like a prowler when you least expect it. And your need like an armed man. What does that mean? You can't stop it. You, if someone's coming toward you with a gun, you can't stop them. And so what God is saying is, 
I'm opposed to laziness because if you're a sluggard, and you see how in the verses that were read, uh, the, the verses consider the ants. Have you ever seen an ant that's just laying there with its eight little feet up in the air, you know, and sunglasses on? Are you kidding? Ants never stop. I mean, they just, I saw a clip on uh, Twitter last week that showed someone had dropped a, um, a bracelet, and I don't know if it had oil on it or what, but it had something on it the ants wanted. And enough ants, I mean, it was just like they were on top of each other, they dragged the bracelet. The bracelet was like 100 times bigger than them. But they got together, and some ants were pulling the other ants, you know, and, and all the ants were holding on to it. And they were actually, in the little Twitter clip, it was really cute, they were moving that, that bracelet. God uses ants as a picture. You never see ants, you know, a big ant whipping them. They just, see what it says? It says, consider the ant. They don't have a captain. They don't, verse 7, they don't have an overseer. They don't have a ruler. They know they have to get their food in the summer, and they gather their food. Why are you slumbering, you sluggard? So God is opposed to laziness. Uh, now look at chapter 10 of Proverbs and verse 5. He who gathers in the summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Uh, again, it's very clear. Look at Proverbs 15 and verse 19. Um, the way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. Uh, it's always a struggle when you're lazy. You're always behind. You're always, you know, it's, it's just, God says it's like a hedge of thorns. It's just painful to be lazy because God designed us to not be lazy. And when we are, we're resisting God. Look at Proverbs 22 and verse 13. The lazy man... Verse 13 says, there's a lion outside, I'll be slain in the streets. What does that mean? Unfounded fears. Lazy people have every excuse. They say, I can't do that because, you know, whatever. I, I, I can't get that job. You know, I'll have to ride, I'll have to walk, you know, and a car will run over me. So God says, beware of that. And then look at Proverbs 26, uh, verses 12 to 16. And by the way, for your projects, a great project would be to do a study on this. This would be a great, if you haven't got your 10 done, you could just pull some of these and do a project on laziness. And I'll show you how I would do it. 2212. Do you see a man wise in his eyes? There's more hope of a, few, of a fool than for him. Verse 13. The lazy man says there's a lion in the road. We already read that. Same thing. A lion in the streets. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. So I, I wrote, because I have done this chapter, I wrote for verse 13, lazy people have unfounded fears, verse 13. Verse 14, my observation was, the lazy man has an undisciplined life. Now look at verse 15. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and wearies him to bring it up to his mouth. He's too lazy to even eat. He has unsatisfied desires. And then look at verse 16. The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. The lazy man is unresponsive in his heart. He won't take in wisdom. So you could title your study, God as opposed to laziness, draw out some of those truths I just said, and then the prayer would be this. Lord, help me not to give in to my fears. Why? The Bible says God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. That's 1 Timothy 1.7. God doesn't want us to be afraid. Uh, I don't want to be undisciplined. The Bible says in, in 1 Timothy 4.7, discipline yourself for godliness. Okay, now let's talk about how to apply this. God says work hard and don't be lazy. Number one, learn to discipline your body to get up early. Other than a very few people, most of the world operates during daylight hours, other than a few people, you know, the people that have to run the emergency services and all that. But do you know what our generation has done? 
It's this whole idea that I'm going to stay up as late as I want doing what I want to do, and I'm going to sleep to the very last minute, the very last minute, and then jump up and, and start my day. Learn to discipline your body to get up early. Why? Well, who is the example? The ultimate example for all of us. We're all supposed to learn to be like who? Jesus. What does it say about Jesus? He stayed up all night doing what? Gaming? Listening to music or watching music videos? No. Praying. But normally, he didn't stay up all night. It says he arose a great while before day. Why? Because he started his day focusing on God. Uh, Let's just look at these Proverbs. Proverbs 20 and verse 13. And just see what God says about this. Do not love sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you'll be satisfied with bread. Do you know what one of the marks of a foolish person is? They love to sleep. They love to sleep. That's not the purpose of life, to, to rest and pamper ourselves. We are supposed to be a good soldier of Christ. Can you imagine a soldier that overslept? I mean, we just saw what happens. Uh, this whole Gaza war was they were on a holiday weekend and the normal defenses of Israel were not running like normal. I don't know if you guys have noticed the examination of this, but it's in the news. That they had had so many years of peace that some of the soldiers were not on duty, on their post, at their spots. Do you know what Edward Gibbon, the, the man that wrote about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, do you know what he said? Do you know why the Roman Empire actually lost its place? The soldiers stopped wearing their armor because it was too hard. It was too hard to put on. It took too long. They didn't want to get up early enough to get all that armor on. It was heavy. It rubbed against them. And so they started going to battle at first without their helmets on. And then they stopped wearing the, the big heavy metal. And then they stopped wearing the, the other parts. And soon, more and more and more of the soldiers got wounded. Before the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, they rarely lost any battles. Because they were desi- the Roman soldiers were designed, when they put their shields down, they interlocked. And others would put them up here. And they never got shot with arrows. They never got hit with all the sling stones. Because they all had all the pieces and they all fit together. But they started not disciplining themselves. Look at Proverbs 24 and see what else God says. Proverbs 24 and verse 30. I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. And when I looked, I considered it well. And I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler. Same words. And your need like an armed man. Unexpectedly, unstoppably. Learn to discipline your body by getting up early. Number two, learn the discipline of doing the hard jobs first. The easier job second, then you can have fun. You know, if, if you're doing projects, do the hardest one first. At least start on it. That's something we, I mean, that's a, that's a mark of discipline in your life, and Proverbs talks about it. Number three, learn to like work even if it's hard. Ask God to grant his blessing and favor on your work. Uh, think about Joseph in Genesis 39. It talks about he diligently did his work, like to work. Did you know God said, commanded us to work? Our, the world wants to go against everything God says. And so God says, you know, the, the roles, God gave gender-specific roles. The world doesn't like that, and so we have gender dysphoria. Uh, God said that marriage is to between a husband and wife. The world doesn't like that. And so, you know, they either don't have marriage or they, you know, they, they have same-sex marriage. God says that we're supposed to be disciplined in work. And the world says, no, we'll give you guaranteed income. You don't have to work. 
It's a total attack on what Genesis said is God's will for us. Number four, don't try to make money by deceit or fraud. God says, we covered that last hour on the money thing. God says, don't try and cut corners. Don't try and, and, and trick people to get money. Just work hard and I'll bless it. Number five, God says it's wrong to assume that others owe you a handout. And boy, is that growing in our world. They say the rich people shouldn't be rich. They should give all their money away. And, well, look what God says, Proverbs 13, 4. Proverbs 13 and verse 4. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing. He wants, but he's not willing to get out of bed. He's not willing to tend his field. He's not willing to fix his wall. He's not willing to even, you know, one of the Proverbs says that you kill an animal in the field hunting and you won't even dress it and clean it. Don't fall into an entitlement mentality. That's where we are in our culture today. And it's a direct attack on the Genesis pattern that God gave us. Number six, if you are a lazy person or if you tend toward laziness in certain areas of your life, confess that as sin to God. That's what uh, that first verse I showed you in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, Paul said to them, Don't, I command you, stop that. Whether at home or at work or in ministry, admit to God that you haven't been working as hard as you should. By the way, he knows already. See, that's one of the things about this, that the, the God's way and man's way, in God's way, he's always watching. In man's way, it's this, like, I'm going to hide this. It's like denying that God is watching. They think that if, if they do it when no one's watching, that it's okay. God says, no, I'm watching all the time. That's what made Joseph succeed. Joseph said, how can I do this with Potiphar's wife and sin against God? And Potiphar's wife says, where's God? Joseph saw. Joseph saw God was watching. And, and so God knows already if we're not working hard. You know, a lot of people, as long as uh, only their friends know they're lazy, they think it's okay. It's not okay. God is watching and ask him to cleanse you from the sin. Look at Proverbs 28, 13. 28, 13. He who covers his sin will not prosper. It doesn't matter if it's the sin of pride or the sin of laziness or the sin of dishonesty. If we cover our sins, we will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes. So in other words, confession is we take and that's why we write these prayers uh, in our journals. And, and uh, I can show you some of my Proverbs prayers, but here I'll, I'll illustrate them. We read Proverbs and say, Lord, I see that I'm starting to have these lazy tendencies. And so we hold them up and we say, God, you already know about this. You already know that, that I love the, the snooze button. And I actually plan to train my body that I'm going to snooze about five times. Do you know what that does? That, that causes us to think it's okay to do what Proverbs said is foolish, to turn on our bed like a door to its hinge. In other words, we just keep going like this. And what it, it back and forth is what Proverbs says, like a door to its hinge. And so I lift up that what God already sees and says, Lord, this is not, this is not what you want. You want me to work hard. You want me not to be lazy. I agree with you that I am. And so I ask you to cleanse me from that the sin. Do you know why most people stay lazy? They don't think it's sin. They think it's good. They think it's fun. And God doesn't. And so, number seven, abandoning laziness and growing in diligence means you have to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Look at Proverbs 31, 27. This is talking about the diligent uh, woman, the, the virtuous woman, the wonderful wife and mother. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. One of the things I, I think is amazing, I've watched Bonnie all of our married life. 
when it's fall or when it's the end of summer and all the stores are selling everything for half price from the summer, Bonnie used to go to the store and somehow in her mind, she knew what size the kids would be next year. And she would buy all the half price clothes when they were on sale. And I, I used to marvel at that. I thought, how do you, I didn't even think about that. But that's part of what a diligent woman, Proverbs says does, that she, look at verse 27. She watches over the ways of her household. She knows what they're going to need before the next season comes and is not idle. She's working on it now. So you might not have children. You might not be buying clothes for them. So what are some ways we can apply this in our lives? Uh, number one, ask the Spirit to make you a hard worker. When I used to counsel couples, one of the problems that married couples had is that the wife felt unloved by the husband. And so a lot of wives would come and make an appointment with me as a pastor and would march in their husband and they would sit in front of me in my office and the wife would say, do something with him. And I'd say, okay, let me, let me do something with him. And I, I'd say, what's the problem? And the wife would say, he doesn't love me. And I would look at him and I'd say, what do you think of what she just said? And the man would say, she knows I love me. I love her. I said, okay, look at her in the eye. Turn in your chair and look at her and say, I love you. He said, no, she knows I love you. I love her. I said, no, say it. He said, she knows it. And what I found is there was an unwillingness, look at this, to actually say it out loud. Did you know we don't start changing until we actually say to the Lord, I need help. And so I would sit them down in my office and I'd say, we're not leaving until you, Mr. Husband, look your wife in the eye and say out loud, I love you. It was, you talk about fun. Here I am, I'm the pastor, and the man is going, uh, how do I get out of this? And finally, you could see him struggling. And finally, he'd say, I love you. <laughs> well, that was a start. You know what I would eventually do? I would say to the wife, put your hands out like this. And so she, the women are always, they just want whatever they want. And I'd say to the man, take her hands. And finally, he would take the hands. And finally, he would look at her. And finally, he'd say, I love you. Did I tell the story of the Mexican pastors here? Bonnie and I were invited to go to Mexico City to a group of church planters. Couples that moved to Mexico City to plant churches and villages, 250 couples, that's 500 people, were supported by this ministry. And they moved to one of the largest cities in the world. And they lived in the villages. Not the inner city, the villages all the way around. And each one of them, in their home, planted a church. They had been doing this, some of them for 10 years, some of them for 20 years, some of them for 30 years. All of them had churches of about 100 people. So that means they had 25,000 people they had led to Christ. And I mean, what an amazing work of God. And you know what the mission found out? Their children were not following the Lord. Their children weren't even going to the churches. And a lot of marital conflicts was between the couples. So they invited Bonnie and me to come. They said, would you do something to our church planners to stir up their marriages? I said, I'd love to come and stir up the marriages. And so I did Ephesians 5 with them. And on the very first class day that we met, Bonnie and I went to this town. I could tell you stories about this town. This town where the conference was is where Mexico City dumped their sewer. Mexico City takes the sewer trucks, the sewer, and takes it up into the mountains and dumps it out in the desert because they don't have a, a system because Mexico City is down in a lower lake bed. So they truck it out and they dump it up there. And so the land around that is really cheap because it smells like a porta potty in August. If you've ever been to a porta potty, an outdoor toilet, in hot summer, it just almost makes you faint. It smells so bad. That's what the whole town smelled like. So we're, we're in a porta potty town with 500 people, Bonnie and I teaching. 
I mean, and I got, you know what? You get used to the smell after a while. You couldn't even smell it by the second day. It just, I guess, broke your nose. And I had all the couples in front of me, and I said, okay, let's just do the basics. All of you are pastors and missionaries. And I said, let's all stand. And so the translator's right here next to me, and he said, I said, tell him, let's all stand. He said, wait a minute, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He said, what are you going to have them do? I said, well, tell them to stand, and I'll show you. He said, okay. And he said, you know, something in their language. And so then they all stood. And I said, now turn and face one another like this. And he looked at me, and he said, what are you going to do? He said, Mexican men are macho. I said, what? He said, what are you going to do? He said, they won't do it. I said, I told him. So then he isn't cooperating. So I went, you know, and I did hand motions. I said, face each other. And they got to, so, I mean, they're still, they didn't know what we were doing. So I have 250 couples standing all over the room like this. And I said to him, now tell them to repeat after me. Look in their wife's eyes and repeat after me. And the poor translator, Bonnie was praying. He was, have you ever had a translator that refuses to translate? I mean, that's what was going on. And so finally, you just, his shoulders went down. He went, okay. And he started working with me. And I just went through what Ephesians 5 says every godly husband should say to his wife that I'm going to love you with Christ's love, that I am going to serve you as Christ served the church. You know, the, all of those things. I said, but I want you to say them out loud to your wife. And then after we did that, it was the wife's turn to say, you remember yesterday we were talking about the marriage thing, that list of what the church does to Christ and Christ does to the church, that's what they were doing. I went through that with them. The lights were not like these lights. They were can lights. They're like little spotlights that go straight down in this auditorium. And so it, it profiled the people's faces. And as we were going through it, I started watching and I could see 500 people standing and 250 of them. Look, this is what they had. They had little streaks like this down their faces. The women all started crying. I've never seen a group cry like this. And I didn't think anything of it. I just kept doing my thing. On the break, Bonnie was standing there. The women all came over to Bonnie, and this is what they said. They said, your husband made my husband say something to me he's never said in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And one of the women put it best. She said, I don't care if he meant it or not. I just can't believe he said it out loud. Do you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to say out loud to him, to actually say, I agree with you. I want you to change me. We need to reread re -read and even memorize Proverbs that pertain to laziness. We need to trust God. He'll help us to overcome bad habits we've developed regarding work and diligence. When you're tempted to be lazy, ask the Spirit to help you. Remind yourself. That's why we, we learn these verses. Okay. Number eight, show how the Proverbs on diligence and laziness are important to you by reading them to your family and then applying them. The people that live closest to you, your family, some of you can tell the others that live around you, you know what, I'm really struggling with this. I sleep to the last minute. It's not a good testimony. I can't be a good, effective soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and say, will you help me be accountable? Uh, will you, I mean, in our Bible studies, uh, we used to, when we met at 6 a.m., some of the men never got up early. And they would all come trudging in five minutes late. And, and instead of making fun of them, we'd say, we're just glad that you made it. And how can we help you? Do you want us to text you and remind you? Okay, number nine. Ask God to give you the opportunity to become a hard worker and then look for him to answer uh, in every realm of your life, at home, at work, at school, in ministry. Ask him to give you opportunities. And Proverbs 6 talks about, Proverbs 24 talks about that. But what really should motivate us to do the right thing? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.10, because I don't know if you've thought about this, but we all have an appointment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body. Did you catch that? What you do with your body, where your body goes, how you treat your body, what your body wears, what your body's habits are, we have to explain to God. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that we explain, verse 10, whether what we've done is good or bad. Now, for just a second, I want you to think about Christ has taken all the sin in our life and erased it, the record of it. So in my life, here is all my, my lifetime of 168 hour weeks, all the time in my life, any sin is erased, forgiven, the record of it gone. All the rest of the time, the time that I spend, you know, working out and listening to music and watching things and studying and sitting through classes, all that stuff that's not sin that I just do in my life is still here. And that, my life spending without sin, is what comes before the 2 Corinthians 5.10 judgment seat of Christ. And what God does is he puts it through the fire. He, I saw some of you sitting out there around the fire there. So you put stuff in the fire, and it burns up, and when the fire is done, whatever's left is what survived the fire. And usually it's just ashes and little, little chunks. What are choices that keep us from having most of our life burned up? In other words, we wasted our life. Well, here they are. There's a great, if any of you want to um, read something, John Piper, you ever heard of John Piper? He wrote a book to young people. It's called Don't Waste Your Life. And it's free, it's online. You type that into Google, Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. It's right there. Basically, what he talks about is what keeps us from serving the Lord in our daily life. And so, what he comes to is Revelation 3 that says, beware of being rich, increased in goods, and needing nothing and not following the Lord. I summarized it this way. Beware of a lust for comfort and convenience. That will keep you from serving the Lord. Did you know it's uncomfortable to serve the Lord and it's inconvenient to serve the Lord? And by the way, Piper tells great stories. Beware of wanting to be recognized. The Lord says that the things that he rewards are what we do in secret. Remember Matthew 6? It isn't that anybody will know. Did you know the greatest ministries? Most people would not have known what David, Brain, what David uh, Livingstone did for the Lord, except the reporter from America tracked him down and found him in Africa and made him famous by writing an article. Most of the great things that have been done for the Lord, nobody knows about but the Lord. And, and what, what we see is that Satan wants us to want convenience. Hey, I was a pastor. Did you know whenever it rained or snowed, the attendance went down in church? Did you catch that? When it rained or snowed, people didn't come to church. What does that mean? They want to be comfortable and convenient. Did you know if you go out in the rain, it ruins your hair? right? Doesn't ruin mine. <laughs> you know, it, think about it. I'm, but I'm being serious. If they found out if people can't find a parking place close to the church, they don't come. That's part of what church planners learn. You've got to have parking places close. Why? Because we lust for comfort and convenience. We love to be recognized. We want to be secure. And the Lord says those, those will erase uh, your reward. Here's another one. You ever heard of exceptionism? That's a rare English word. Do you know what exceptionism is? That all that stuff that I've been talking about that God says about Proverbs applies to all of the class except me. Exceptionism is it doesn't apply to me. Except me. And so what happens is when we hear that God wants us to be hardworking, we say that doesn't, it's okay for me to be lazy. It's okay for me 
to sleep to the last minute. It's okay for me to always be late and behind and everything else. And then the last one I call pockets of pride. And unmortified pockets of pride means allowing pride to grow and make me secretly, inwardly proud of something about myself. Thinking I'm smarter than others, proud of my achievements, I'm better than others, proud of my goodness, and that's a really bad one. I'm not as bad as someone else. Do you understand? That keeps us from Christ's reward. Because I am supposed to open my life. That's why your, your journals are so important. You read the Bible, and you find what God says. You write it down, and then you open your life before the Lord and say, I want you to change that in my life. Do you know why we wouldn't do that? We'd say, oh, you don't need to change that in my life. I'm not as bad as them. And we're always comparing ourselves to others. Okay, the last thing. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, and then we're going to be done with this class. We're, we're going to be actually on time. Back up from 2 Corinthians, where I just was, to 1 Corinthians 6, and think about what it says in verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now think about that. Our body is a, a vessel that the Holy Spirit lives inside. So my body is walking around as God's temple who is in you, whom you have from God, and therefore you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. And in your spirit. How do I glorify God in my body and my spirit? God says, I want you to work hard. I want you not to be lazy. I want your body to not follow the culture around you, man's way. I want your body to be diligent. I'm watching you. I know your motivations and I want you to do that. And you are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. When, when I was uh, your age, I used to live in Michigan, and there was a new company called Burger King starting. That's how old I am. You ever heard of Burger King? Uh, and they had what was called a Whopper. Have you ever heard of a Whopper? I mean, that's, it's their biggest hamburger. And when you go out and eat lunch, look at, there are two plates. There are plates this big, and then there are those smaller saucer plates. The smaller saucer plates are how big Whoppers were. They were Whoppers. That's where the term Whopper came from. It was big. And I remember you could get two of those for one American dollar. Two of those giant Whoppers for one dollar. And I would go for lunch every day, and I would buy a Whopper and get the free one, and I'd get two and I'd eat them. But I started going and waiting in line, and I noticed how they made them. And at one end of the cook, they showed you. It was their... They did it your way, and they cooked them over flames. And so while you were standing at the counter, instead of it all being hidden, you could see it. And there would be a worker, and they would take the patties and put them on a little chain, and it would go like this over fire, and fire would burn up, and it would cook them, and then it would flip them over like this, the little conveyor belt, while you were watching. And by the time it got to this side, another worker was standing there, and they would have the bun and the, the top like this, and they'd hold it out, and the burger would fall off, onto the bun, and they'd put the lid on, and then someone else would put all the toppings on it. Well, I started watching that, and I thought, in fact, I started going to Burger King every day to watch that because I thought only what makes it through the fire comes to the other end, and it's caught. And I thought, my whole life, I'm dumping stuff on the conveyor belt that Jesus Christ talks about in 2 Corinthians 5.10. And whatever doesn't get burnt up, it's not a Burger King employee wearing a hairnet and gloves. It's actually Jesus that's at the other side of the fire. And he is collecting what's left of our lives. And that's going to be our eternal reward. So the choices you make in wisdom to live life God's way diligently knowing he's watching, that's going to survive the fire. And it's going to be coming off the conveyor belt 
And Jesus catches it. And you know what it says in Matthew he's going to say? He's going to look at each of us. And whatever's left of your life and my life that doesn't burn up. That means sins are gone, but whatever we did with our time that wasn't wasted, he says, well done. What does he say? Good and faithful servant. That's the motivation why God says we're here to work hard. Have a great break. And we have one more hour of Proverbs, don't we? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Do you want another hour? Yes. Or just go play video games? No, that's not a choice. Have a good break. <laughs>